When a prolific young actor came to find himself in a motorcycle accident, he gradually began to change over time, coming to completely lose his mind. While he showed signs of violence, nobody could imagine how far it would really go. Oftentimes, when we think about the way that child actors turn out, we picture, you know, Hollywood child lovers or greedy parents being at fault for the way that they inevitably turn out. This case, while it does involve a child actor going down a very dark path, actually involves a very different sort of outside influence. The subject of today's story is an actor with many different roles under his belt, Johnny Lewis. Johnny grew up in various different neighborhoods of Los Angeles, such as in North Hollywood and Sherman Oaks. He was the second out of three children born to his parents, Michael and Devona. While it has been said that Johnny was raised in a Jewish-oriented household, his parents were actually practicing Scientologists. This might have helped him break into acting. Johnny's mom started taking him to various auditions when he was about six years old. A year later, he got his first role, taking part in an elevator safety video with an animated raccoon. After that, he started getting more spots in commercials, like one for Pizza Hut and another for Coca-Cola. As he grew into his teens, he started getting better and better roles, appearing on shows like Seventh Heaven. He even acted as one of the cadets on Malcolm in the Middle and as Drake's drummer on Drake and Josh. Johnny got himself roles in more and more shows as he got into his later teens. He was in so many things that it's likely everyone out there has seen at least one presentation that he was a part of. Boston Public, The Guardian, American Dreams, Raise Your Voice, Underclassmen, you name it. He was a major part of the Fox sitcom Quintuplets and even acted on The O.C. and was in the fifth season of Smallville to boot. Once Johnny finished school at 18, he decided to fully dedicate himself to acting. Having a little bit of money saved up, he decided to move out of his parents' house and go straight to Hollywood. There, he lived with a bunch of actors in a place called the Wilton Hilton, a place widely known to those in the entertainment industry. For a time, Johnny continued practicing Scientology with his parents. His parents were no ordinary Scientologists, they were of the highest rank in the entire church. They called this rank Operating Thetan Level 8. According to L. Ron Hubbard, this level contains people who have, quote, knowing and willing cause over life, thought, matter, energy, space, and time. It's basically the stage that everyone knows from South Park, where you come to learn that Lord Xenu dumped a bunch of aliens into volcanoes that died and became ghosts and latched onto humans and caused all of our problems. Johnny was pretty active in the church himself, even starring in some Scientology training films and acting as a sort of representative for their drug rehabilitation program called Narcocon. However, Johnny decided to finally leave the religion in his early 20s, disillusioned with the whole thing. Since then, most of the evidence of his connection to the church was purged from the internet by the rest of the church. In the mid-2000s, Johnny really struck gold when he came to start dating Katy Perry. The two really hit it off after leaving their parents' strict religions and getting out on their own. The two dated for a few years from 2005 to around 2006, being seen at various events together. Johnny got what is probably his most well-known role when he scored a role on Sons of Anarchy. This was where he played a young biker named Halfsack, called as such due to losing a ball in Iraq. He was the more subdued and soft character of the show, acting as a good foil to all of the more aggressive characters on set. Johnny felt that his character offered a bit of relief from the tension on the show and portrayed him as such, winning over a lot of fans along the way. Johnny really wanted to be more than just an actor, though. He always kind of saw himself as more of the artist-slash-writer type. He started writing a lot in journals and even began a couple of novels that he never quite finished. While on this journey, he heard from a photographer taking his headshots about a place called the Writer's Villa. The Writer's Villa was a large house in the hills where creatives would live, run by an eccentric older lady named Kathy Davis. Johnny decided to call her up and see if he could get himself a room. In April of 2009, he ended up moving into a room called the Red Suite on the second floor. The rent was steep, nearly $3,000 at a time when rent was quite a bit cheaper in general, but he thought it would be worth it. Kathy, the owner of the villa, loved to open up her place to different artists and eccentrics. 
She had many famous Hollywood stars living out there at one point or another. She was a Texan who had moved out to California in the 50s. She went to UCLA and worked all sorts of jobs in the publishing field before marrying her husband. Together, they purchased the massive home together and had a daughter. By the 80s, though, the two had divorced and their daughter had grown up and moved out. So, Kathy decided to use the massive home as an incubator of sorts for aspiring artists who showed promise. Through word of mouth, the villa's reputation only grew. Whenever someone moved in, they would usually give the place and the vibe a whole lot of praise, leading to a lot of demand from others in high positions. It was fairly common to rent a room in the house and use the common areas to mingle with other young artists and writers. As much as Johnny enjoyed his time there, he wouldn't be able to stay for much longer. He had started dating an actress named Diane Gaeta and gotten her pregnant on accident. While she was pregnant, the two actually split up, but Johnny was still very excited to have a kid. In April of 2010, their daughter, Kula May, was born. The two decided to live together and co-parent nonetheless, moving into an apartment together in Hollywood. This didn't work out for too long though, as you might expect. Soon after, Johnny ended up moving out and found himself in a long, bitter custody battle, a battle that he did not come to win. This was when Johnny's life really began to crumble. He found himself no longer enjoying acting on Sons of Anarchy, feeling that the show was leaning too much toward violence and not enough on plot. He told the creator of the show, Kurt Sutter, that he didn't really want the role anymore. So the decision was made to kill him off in the second season finale. It was now 2011, and one of Johnny's only pleasures left in life was his motorcycle, a Triumph bike. He would ride it around pretty often, simply enjoying the ride. However, this bike would be the crux for his downfall. On October 30th, one day before Halloween, Johnny was driving his Triumph through 29 Palms where he ended up losing control and crashing. He was rushed to the hospital where they checked him for signs of a concussion or other damage to his head. After it seemed that he was fine, they decided to let him leave and go home. Johnny's father, Michael, though, felt that this was a big mistake. Immediately, he came to notice that Johnny's behavior was getting more and more strange. He urged Johnny to get an MRI done, even scheduling appointments for him twice, but Johnny always refused to go to them. He then tried to get Johnny into some sort of psychiatric treatment instead, but again, he refused. All the while, Johnny's behavior was getting more erratic and strange as time went on. It wasn't only his father who noticed, but also his friends as well. One friend, who took an acting class with him, noticed that he had changed pretty drastically. For instance, he kept speaking in what sounded like a bad British accent, but didn't seem to notice it himself. When this friend asked him what he was doing, Johnny acted like he hadn't noticed and simply shrugged it off. For now, his behavior, while indeed weird, was relatively harmless. Johnny went on to star in his final two roles, acting in a movie called Magic Valley in 2011, and then in another called $186 to Freedom. He would never act again. This was because Johnny began to see himself getting into some trouble with the law. He went on to get arrested three different times in 2011 and 2012. One morning, Johnny was hanging out in the condo that he had previously bought for his parents. While his mom cooked him breakfast, he decided to go out and take a walk in his pajamas. As he walked past another one of the condos, he thought that he heard someone screaming for help. He broke into the place to see what was going wrong, only to see that the unit was empty. Two men soon showed up and demanded that he leave. Johnny then picked up an empty bottle and cracked each one of them over the head with it. A huge fight broke out that spilled out onto the walkway. Johnny bit one of the men on the arm as he tried to get away, but the two managed to hold him down until the police showed up. While Johnny claimed that he was acting in self-defense, he had in reality broken into their home and lashed out violently when told to leave. He was charged with trespassing, burglary, and assault with a deadly weapon. After, he was sent to the Twin Towers Jail in LA. He was only there for three days before he lashed out again, this time being confined to a psychiatric ward. His father then bailed him out after about eight days in custody. 
Johnny came back to his parents' house completely in shambles, complete with a swollen face and two black eyes. His older sister said that he acted very much like a wounded animal, refusing to let anyone get near him and even keeping all the lights off in the house. He actually got so frustrated at people turning the lights back on that he went out to the fuse box and turned off the electricity entirely, something that would become sort of a habit over time. For the next few weeks, he continued to act out, going as far as cutting his wrists in an attempt to end it all. So, his father and some family friends decided to stay around and watch him at all times whenever possible. After a while, this seemed to work and Johnny's mental state evened out. So, his dad decided to let him live on his own once again. This didn't work though, as Johnny got back into trouble immediately. Right after going to live on his own, he was arrested once again for sucker punching a man at a yogurt shop. He was then once again bailed out. Then, only a few days later, he was sent to the hospital for hypothermia after walking fully clothed into the ocean. Soon after, Johnny was arrested once again, this time for trying to break into a random woman's apartment he said he thought was his friend's place. He pled no contest in that case and was released on bail once again. His probation officer said that, due to his repeated problems in such a short time, he was concerned not only for Johnny's well-being, but also for the community at large as long as he was free. He said that it was pretty clear that Johnny not only had some mental problems, but believed he also had some sort of drug or alcohol problem as well. All the while, Johnny's psychological state was getting worse rather than better. When a friend picked him up for one of his many court appearances, he said that he seemed to be another person entirely, saying, he had a look I've only seen on disturbed veterans of war. His memory was scattered. He vacillated between basic lucid conversation and incoherence. Johnny's family and his lawyers did all they could to argue that he should go to rehab for a marijuana addiction rather than going on to trial. Johnny himself actually fully understood that this was ridiculous and even laughed about it with friends privately. His counselors felt that this was pretty dumb as well, pushing for him to go for alcohol dependency instead. It was then decided that Johnny would spend a couple of days in jail before probably heading off to rehab. However, this didn't happen and it actually took months for him to get out. During that time, his mental state only worsened as he simply waited in a jail cell day after day after day. Johnny was sent to the Ridgeview Ranch in Altadena for group sessions while still being in jail. While in rehab, it didn't seem that Johnny had a substance abuse problem at all, after all. So his doctors would go on to prescribe him Zyprexia and Abilify, drugs commonly used to treat schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He refused to take the medication, though, instead hiding them under his tongue and spitting them out later. The biggest problem was that Johnny never really did get an official diagnosis, so nobody was really equipped to deal with his problems. His father said, we got the motorcycle head injury, that he's been beaten in the head 17 times. Then when he's in jail, he's pounding his own head against the concrete and attempting to leap from the second story pier. Then you have the doctor's own diagnosis of brain trauma, and that's just the stuff we know about. After a few months in jail, it appeared that Johnny's state was actually improving. But that was unfortunately not going to be the case for too long. Due to overcrowding in the jails, he was eventually released on September 21st, 2012. Everything would then come crashing down around him shortly after. Once Johnny got out, he checked himself into the Los Feliz Hotel in Atwater Village. A few days later, his dad came out to help him buy some new clothes before taking him out to the valley to pick up his bike so he could get mobile again. Johnny, wanting to return to a place that gave him some semblance of peace, asked his dad if he could call the Riders Villa and see if there were any rooms available. His father thought that this might be a good move, saying, This is a place he was familiar with, and they will give him a lot of love. Kathy Davis was happy to have him back, even preparing his old room for his return. Johnny moved back in and settled fairly quickly. The next day, his father called to check in, only for Johnny to say, I'm busy, what do you want? And telling him that he would talk later before hanging up. September 26, 2012 The night before, Johnny had actually returned to old habits and gone out to the fuse box, disabling all of the electricity in the entire villa. Due to this, Kathy scolded him for a bit, warning him not to do that again. 
It's likely that this incident was still fresh on Johnny's mind, and in a complete fury, he decided to confront her about it. Johnny picked up a hammer from the house and made his way up to Kathy's room, where she was caught off guard, no idea that anything was going on. He began to punch her over and over again. It's believed that he then used the hammer, knocking her down to the ground before strangling her with his bare hands. It's believed that he stomped on her head afterward, and then he picked up a mechanical pencil and stabbed her in the face multiple times. Later reports said of the attack, He fractured her entire skull and obliterated the left side of her face, leaving her brain exposed. Brain and tissue matter seen on the floor around her. Her face is covered in blood. Her nose is split down the middle and her upper jaw is split open. Then, while still in a frenzy, Johnny picked up Kathy's beloved cat and killed it in much the same manner, before throwing it into the shower and finally leaving her room. One of Johnny's neighbors, who he had previously introduced himself to, was happy to see him. After all, he seemed like a nice enough young man. But he noticed that he saw Johnny pacing up and down the sidewalk on the corner of the villa wearing nothing but jeans and shoes while sweating profusely. There was a painter on the other side of the fence, painting the wall of this neighbor's house. Seeing this, Johnny randomly hopped the fence and abruptly assaulted him, going as far as hitting him with a 2x4 lying nearby. Johnny's neighbor heard his wife frantically calling for him, coming out to see Johnny beating the life out of the painter. He yelled for Johnny to stop, to which Johnny stood up and decked him in the face as well. The 70-year-old man stood back up and clocked Johnny back across the temple. He was surprised to see that the crazed young man didn't even flinch in the least. He said that he seemed to have superhuman strength, all while sporting a blank expression. During that time, both the neighbor's wife and the painter were able to retreat back into the house. The neighbor soon followed, trying to slam the door behind him. But then, Johnny reached his arm in through the crack of the door after him like some sort of horror movie. All three of them slammed on the door together until Johnny's arm hurt so badly that he finally pulled it out and left. He jumped the fence once again, this time returning to the villa. The three then locked up their whole house and called the police. Other neighbors had called the police as well after hearing Kathy screaming previously. Johnny could hear the police coming. He made his way up to the roof of the villa where he felt he could jump away and make his escape. As you might expect, this didn't work. Either he tried to jump over the fence, or he simply fell. Either way, he came slamming down 15 feet to the pavement on the ground, landing on his head and crushing the left side of his skull. He died instantly. The police arrived very shortly after, first seeing Johnny lying lifeless in the driveway. The scene they would come across inside was even more gruesome. While the first floor was clean, they noticed a hammer clearly covered in blood. Making their way upstairs, they came upon the grisly scene of Kathy and her cat. At first glance, they thought that Johnny was merely another victim, but they soon came to realize that he had either jumped or fallen off of the roof shortly before they arrived. Hearing from the neighbors and seeing the scene, they felt that there was no other explanation other than that Johnny had probably been using some fairly hard drugs. The tabloids then picked up on this and reported it as well. Little did they know, this was actually far from the case. After an autopsy was performed, it was shown that Johnny had absolutely no drugs or alcohol in his system at all when any of this happened. He didn't even show positive for any prescription medication or weed, just nothing at all. There was also no sign that he jumped off of the roof intentionally, with the pattern of injury being much more consistent with a fall. It was ruled that his death was accidental. After news of the murder broke, everyone who knew Johnny was left stunned. They knew he had gotten into fights before, but they hoped it wouldn't reach this level. Some of them, though, weren't at all surprised. The creator of Sons of Anarchy, Kurt Sutter, was one of the first to speak out about the whole thing. He tweeted, It was a tragic end for an extremely talented guy, who unfortunately had lost his way. I wish I could say that I was shocked by the events last night, but I was not. I am deeply sorry that an innocent life had to be thrown into his destructive path. Yes, it's a day of mourning, but it's also a day of awareness and gratitude. Sadly, some of us carry the message by dying. Katy Perry, hearing about her ex-boyfriend doing something like this, with no bad blood between them, was left shocked and devastated, not really giving much of a response beyond that. 
Katie's best friend, Shannon Woodward, did tweet out, saying, Johnny Lewis, I love you deeply and madly and always. My heart is broken into a million little pieces. Johnny Lewis was one of my best friends. He was very, very ill. His actions were a despicable result of that. It was not who he was. In the years since Johnny's death, his parents have seemed to return to life as normal. Michael continues to be a very big player in the Church of Scientology, shown smiling happy with various awards at different events. There was someone who wasn't quite so happy with him, though. Johnny's ex, the mother of his child, Diane, now named Diane Marshall Green after a different marriage, had beef with him. Rather than their child, Culla, being the heir to Johnny's estate, it seemed that everything had actually gone to his father. Even after paternity was proven without a shadow of a doubt, Michael still refused to see the child as an heir. While Johnny only had about $41,000 of his acting money left by the time he died, Diane wanted it. Johnny, throughout all of his trouble, had failed to pay about $37,000 in child support. Even so, Michael refused to hand it over. So, Diane decided to sue him. It's unclear if this lawsuit has ever been resolved, but it's likely that Johnny's parents have some of those top-dollar, rabid Scientology lawyers. Now, Johnny is mainly remembered as another tragic tale of a child actor losing their mind in adulthood. Although, this time it wasn't so much related to the industry as it was to a head injury and undiagnosed mental issues. Now, it's hard to look back on any of his projects without remembering his end, and in turn, the murder of Kathy Davis and her pet. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you found it interesting, please give it a like, it really helps me out in the algorithm, and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Just recently, I've started up a podcast with four of my friends called the NBR Podcast. If you like this channel, you might find that interesting as well. I've also opened up a merch store where you can get yourself some cool Dire Trip t-shirts. Link in the description below. If you want, go ahead and follow me on social media, and I really appreciate it when people follow me on Patreon. There you can get videos early, ad-free, and uncensored. Channel memberships are up too, and you get the same benefits there as well. So, this has been your host Kyle. Thank you, and good night.